Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Enrico Rulo. I'm a first year medical student at McMaster. Uh, we're here today with Dr. Mark Crowther, Chair and Professor of Medicine at McMaster, Professor of Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics, as well as the Leo Pharma Chair in Thromboembolism Research. Uh, how are you doing today, Dr. Crowther? I'm great. How are you, Enrico? Well, not too bad. It's the third day of rain in a row, but uh, I hear I get to enjoy quarantine with a sunny light at the end of the tunnel this weekend, so it's something to look forward to. It's, it's uh, Blur's Day, the 4017th of April today. <laughs> Something like that. Um, so I guess today we're just going to discuss generally maybe where you see medicine going with COVID, how it's going to be affected, um, maybe a bit about McMaster specifically as a program. And if we have time, I just have some questions for you about research. Does that sound good? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, happy to chat. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so question number one, Mac's known as a pretty innovative program um, with the learning style and everything like that. What kind of doctors is it that you think they hope to produce having a program like this that is so different from other schools? Uh, that's a great question. So the um, we've thought about this a lot over the years at an administrative level, and Mac is certainly known for all kinds of innovation in education. Really, if you look at doctors who graduate from McMaster compared to doctors who graduate from other places five years after graduation, I suspect you'll find very little difference. Um, the, the the difference is probably in the initial couple of years where the training McMaster tends to produce doctors who haven't spent as much time understanding the nuts and bolts, but have a much better of under, idea of understanding how to gather information and incorporate it into their practice. Uh, it would also be interesting to look to see whether physicians who come out of McMaster tend to engage in a slightly different activity skill set than physicians who come out of elsewhere, particularly with respect to things like uh, outreach programs and uh, working with uh, disadvantaged uh, individuals, both in Canada and elsewhere, because of the focus that we have of our training in, in a more holistic approach to caring for the patient. Well, I would agree. I would say that when we have our professional competency meetings where a lot of the stuff that we discuss is kind of ethics and, you know, advocate advocacy and like its role um, in being a physician. So that makes sense to me. So it sounds like when you're a physician, you have to do a lot of research on your own and, you know, you have to kind of continually try to educate yourself. So you'd say that's one of the biggest parts then of being a McMaster trained doctor is learning where to find the material. Absolutely. Um, you know, our, our, our national accreditation bodies require us to be involved in some form of continuous learning program. And it's a lot easier to do that if you um, have tra been trained in how to properly, not, not actually necessarily review the literature yourself, but understand the quality of the resources that are available to you to help you to stay up to date. Cool. Well, I appreciate that very much. I mean, I'm really enjoying the program so far. So I thank you for your, your role in that. Um, as far as medicine, so where do you see it going in the next 10 years? Like, as my understanding goes, there's a huge backlog of procedures and lost clinics as a result of coronavirus. So how are we kind of going to deal with that in the coming years? That's a great question. Um, you know, 10 years is an awful long time horizon to predict anything, as we've discovered in the last two months. Um, I, I, I would say that if you, if you looked at medicine 10 years from now, uh, a couple of huge changes will be either well along the pathway or largely along the pathway. The first is, uh, you know, doctors are not the best people to look at what a patient has and make sure that you, you collect all the appropriate information, you do the appropriate lab tests and you arrive at the correct diagnosis. Intelligent diagnostic systems are going to be a very important part of what we do in medicine, maybe five years from now, but certain 10 years from now. Um, you know, we, our memories are fallible compared to the memories of, of machines. And so I suspect a lot of the diagnostics that we currently rely on ourselves to remember details of will actually be performed by, by some form of intelligent solution. Um, a lot of the diagnostics that are interpreted by humans right now will be interpreted by, um, by intelligent systems. Radiology and pathology, I think, will lead the charge on that. But I think other areas will follow. So I think that a, a big change that is likely to occur is, is the incorporation of intelligent diagnostic and management systems into day-to-day um, -day healthcare. We're starting to see that now in some areas, but I think that will, that will really continue. Um, with regards to the backlog of procedures, you know, that, that's, is a, that is a very large challenge, but that is a six-month or a year-long challenge, mm -hmm. and we will get through that. Um, it, I think a couple of things that are long-term changes will come out of this. I certainly hope that our healthcare system in Ontario and in Canada recognizes the value of the telediagnostics that we're doing right now, that patients really 
enjoy being able to speak with their physicians on the phone, um, enjoy not having to drive into the hospital for many routine assessments. Obviously, there's a lot that still needs to be done in the hospital, but but there's going to be, I think, a big group of patients who, and a big group of, of, of medical, big bunch of medical care that we'll realize can be delivered more effectively using tools like Zoom um, or uh, Ontario Telehealth Network. And certainly, you know, I've been doing all of my clinics remotely over the last um, eight weeks. And for, for what I do, m my patients, I think, in general, find it to be um, a, a great way to get care. Again, you can't, not all care can be delivered that way. Not even maybe half of care can be delivered that way, but a lot of it uh, can be. And I think that patients and physicians um, will find they prefer it. Well, it's interesting. Like I'm doing some coronavirus research now outside of school. And one of the, the most common interventions we saw across different countries was their implementation of telehealth medicine. And the response has been like overwhelmingly positive. A lot of people definitely do like it. And I think a lot of people maybe are just generally scared of going to the hospital in general, or, you know, everyone knows how long it takes, even if you need to go for an emergency room visit. So I think it makes sense. As far yeah, as the... Um, I, just a comment right. about that. I think, you know, right. So just in case there's any patients who listen to this, if you have a medical condition that warrants going to the emergency department, you should go to the emergency department. There's a lot of concern that people are deferring getting acute medical care who should be getting it. And, and the risk then is that their disease will progress past the point that it normally would. The hospitals are incredibly safe right now to go to because they have such an intense focus on COVID-19. And again, on May the 1st, um, 2020, this could change in eight hours or in two weeks, the hospitals in Ontario are empty. Um, and so if you need to get care, now is a great time to get it. Uh, I tell patients, if you're having a heart attack, this is probably the best time to have a heart attack that will ever exist because you will get into the hospital, you will get appropriate care and you will get out of the hospital with a degree of efficiency, which we just normally can't provide in normal times. Right. Okay. So for the actual, for like some of the more serious issues, there is no substitute for going in person, but telehealth yep. can take some of the burden off to facilitate that. That makes sense. Um, as far as just to get back to the AI, but I was interested personally, because when I was doing my MBA, they used to talk a lot about AI. Um, you'd mentioned radiology, radiology and pathology being impacted by it, but do you think it'll change the face kind of of every other specialty as well? Um, for sure. It'll, it'll certainly, it'll certainly, I, I can't imagine a situation with, within which as time passes, patients won't demand that, that every possible diagnosis is considered when they're being evaluated, particularly as the number of diagnoses increase. And so, you know, it, it's not just okay in 2020 to say a person has hypercholesterolemia. There are many potential causes of hypercholesterolemia and, and we're now at the stage where genetic diagnostics, for example, are, are beginning to be applied for run-of-the-mill diseases like um, hypercholesterolemia. And the question is, you know, can I, as a physician, remember every single mutation uh, or, or, or uh, clinical manifestation that could cause hypercholesterolemia? And then as we move further down the pathway and we develop individualized or personalized treatment algorithms, can I possibly remember every single algorithm that's appropriate for every single and the answer? That's obviously no. And so, you know, that, that, that is inevitably going to become part of what we do. I have hypertension and, and, you know, hypertension is not one disease. It's many diseases. And there's not one gene that causes it. There's many diseases that cause it. And there's no way that um, a treating physician can possibly understand the interplay between all the different risk factors that a machine algorithm could. So the role of the physician in that case becomes more of someone like the interpersonal skills become probably the most valued part of the physician then, like just managing the um, patient. That's an, I, I don't know about that. That's an interesting question. I, you know, physicians, the, the way we select physicians right now, we don't select them in, in a system that, that values interpersonal skills. Um, uh, it, it, we select them based on you know, their, their, what they've done in the past, their ability to interview and their intelligence. And, uh, so I don't, I don't know what the role of a physician is going to be in 10 years vis-a-vis um, -vis what it is right now. If you're, if you're going to select physicians, you're going to have the people who are just great interfaces, then you know, you're probably better to have highly trained social workers because the highly trained social workers are going to have much better emotional intelligence than the average physician is. I think the role of the physician will evolve to be um, somebody's going to have to um, understand the the output of the diagnostic algorithm, someone's going to have to be able to act in emergencies. Someone is actually going to have to 
either do surgery or supervise the, the intelligent system that's doing this, the surgery. I think the role of a physician as time changes will evolve more into a, a highly trained manager of a group of different resources that are used to help provide healthcare. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, it was, it was, it's interesting to think about all the different ways that every profession eventually will change with the introduction of different technologies. Um, it's going to be exciting to see for sure. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's an exciting time to be in, in this. The last eight weeks have been more exciting than most of us would want. I think we're all uh-huh. looking forward to return to exciting, but somewhat less intense times. Um, but once, once this passes, um, we, I think we'll, uh, there'll be lots of changes associated with COVID and, and it may accelerate some of the underlying changes, particularly the adoption of, of remote um, working, not just in healthcare, but elsewhere as well. Yeah, I was talking to some of my friends who work in the business world and um, everyone was moved remotely and they all love it. And according to them, their productivity hasn't been hindered too much. So I think you're definitely on point about the moving to remote workplaces. This I think be- that the, when, when people actually evaluate remote working like we're doing right now, um, I would think that on average productivity has actually increased. Um, and I don't, I don't think people actually realize that because a lot of people's time over the last six weeks has actually been spent adapting to the new systems and when the adaptation phase is over and we get used to it then I bet you you'll find people are more productive Uh, you know I I, my joke is that people are really enjoying the 21 second commute Um, uh, you know my commute this morning I was uh, busy doing something else on my computer and my commute essentially consisted of moving my eyes um, about eight centimeters to the left uh, yeah. And so as opposed to getting up, getting into the car, driving to work, getting stuck in traffic, gabbing with the person in the hall, which vacuums an hour out of my day, my commute now is 15 seconds. Yeah. Not to mention the time when she's not having to shower anymore. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you got to do that. That's, um, it, that's very important uh, that people forget about uh, that. Uh, uh, bathing is an important part of everybody's existence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so now that we're on the topic, basically looking towards the future, and this is the last question that I think I had time for. Um, it's really impressed upon us as medical students that research is really important, you know, to be a competitive applicant in this and that. But I was wondering if you could maybe speak to the importance of just research as one of the duties uh, of a physician. Yeah, so that's a that's a great question. Um, the, uh, you know, research is is the reason that things move forward. We've talked a lot during this interview about how uh, how, how fast things are moving forward. And the reason they're moving forward quickly is partly spurred by the exterior force of COVID. Um, but it's a lot around um, uh, how, how much, how fast we can move the science forward. So let's just look at COVID specifically. Um, I, I, over the last two weeks, we've learned a lot about um, the risk of blood clots, which is my area of interest. And, and we've learned that because of um, very carefully done observational studies where Clinicians had an idea. They said, Ooh, patients seem to be having a higher risk of blood clots. They then did an observational study where they actually looked for the frequency with which blood clots were occurring. Uh, they were able to rapidly report that because of the extremely brief turnaround time for papers. Uh, that then led to a group of Canadian researchers getting together to put together a randomized controlled trial, which would normally be a six month process, but it took 48 hours. They then went out to look for funding. You know, funding, which would normally take two years to get, suddenly becomes available on 48 hours in the COVID environment. And now there's a multi-center, potentially multinational randomized control trial being run by Dr. Ryan Zarachansky out of Winnipeg, um, uh, looking at the use of varying intensities of anticoagulation in patients with COVID. And given the number of patients that are available right now with COVID and the extremely high interest in this and the accelerated process of getting studies up and running you know, we might have an answer to this question in six weeks um, uh, if we can actually pull it off. And, 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 and then, in, you know, two weeks after that, the paper gets published and suddenly we have evidence to guide practice. And so, you know, if, 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 in, if in three months from now, we are treating all patients with very severe COVID with therapeutic dose anticoagulation, that's not based on a couple of old, bald experts like me pulling something out of their hat. It's based on science um, that, that will, that, that will, improve the quality of care for patients. No, I think absolutely that notwithstanding COVID, particularly in the academic environment, but everywhere, it's incumbent on physicians to continue to try to push um, the envelope and move us towards better knowledge in all domains of that which we do. That's really the only way that we're going to improve the quality of patient care. 
I appreciate you speaking to that because I feel like it's very easy to get caught up in, you know, we have to do it just because it's part of our, our, like, part of what a student does, but that does definitely flesh it out a little bit, you know, just to get the real world examples of why it is that it's so important. Yeah, and the other thing is that students um, are a super important part of this. So um, some of you will know that at McMaster, a group of medical students uh, got together to produce a sort of a, a very immediate um, tool which reviews every single paper that's being published on COVID, um, estimated to be 200 papers a day right at the moment. Uh, and that team is producing a website where all these papers are are put up and, and immense helpfulness. I was doing an interview with a US media outlet this morning and referred the reporter to that, that resource because it's, a, it's, a, it's the best resource that I'm aware of to find information. So medical students can play a critical part of this whole, um, in this whole enterprise. Awesome. Um, so then kind of in line with that, is there an opportunity to add like broader research experience, do you think, to residency as it is? Um, at, so that I, there's, there's always opportunities to add experiences. Uh, residency, there, there's three different kinds of trainees, just really quickly. There's the undergraduate trainees who are desperate to get into medicine. Um, they are very good research helpers because they want reference letters and um, and 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 uh, and they tend to finish the projects. Um, medical students and residents are a little less reliable because what's driving you guys is somewhat different. Medical students are more reliable than residents because medical students still want reference letters to get into residency programs. Um, and once you get become a resident, you're a lot busier. You've got a lot more responsibilities. There's a lot more going on, not only with your work life, but also with your personal life. And so, you know, residents, some of the best researchers are residents who evolve into faculty members, but um, residents are in a particularly difficult position to try to deliver on final research projects. Um, because of all the other stuff going on in their lives. So I would say that you know, across the spectrum of, of learners from undergraduate students to medical students to residents, there's different skill sets. And uh, there are certainly shining examples of great research productivity who come out of people at each of those different career stages. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I look forward to uh, my time in residency. I'll see just how busy it is because it's really been built up as, as a gauntlet. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I tell the residents that, you know, what, the residents always tell me that they're supremely busy and they are undoubtedly very busy. Uh, but you know, I would I would stack my schedule up against any resident schedule and, and see who's busier. Um, and, and, you know, I'm busier in a different way than I am. But and, uh, certainly right now, I'm putting a lot of hours into this. It's a different kind of hour compared to what residents are doing. But it's, it's, you know, it's, it's all work. Yeah, fair enough. Well, Dr. Kauther, thank you very much for uh, taking the time today. Yeah, no problem. Thanks very much for putting this on. Hopefully it's a useful resource. I think like speaking for myself and, you know, all my classmates or classmates at other med schools who are going to watch it, like I think we definitely will have learned a lot from it. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks very much. Have a great day. You as well.